on to the computer. Yeah. yeah. Just a little little note for yourself. If you record to the computer, it will actually record this gallery view. I like a gallery view where I can see everybody. Mm -hmm. If you could record to the cloud, it defaults to a speaker view. So, and, and I haven't found a way to control that yet. And I've been experimenting. I don't think you can. So if you really, really like this, this gallery view, you have to record to your desktop. So I want to give you tips as we go along as we use this, little quirks. Um, also, um, I found some quirks in terms of aspect ratio when I was editing this in um, iMovie and then I edited it in, in, anyway, LumaFusion and a few other programs or some aspect ratio issues that you get when you record Zoom. So, so we are live. So welcome, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us to explore the notion of online blended learning. We're going to have you um, uh, do a few things today. We're going to break you out into a couple of sessions and we're going to talk about ways that we can use use online blended learning and aspects of authenticity to make a difference in the environments in which you're finding yourself. And there's going to be actually mostly dialogue, communication, exploration, discussion. Uh, we want to find out what you're doing. We want to find out how we can help you. So I just want to start things off by um, sharing my uh, screen and uh, just taking care of a little bit of business and uh, running through a couple of things and then we'll get into the, the body of what we're doing. So, um, uh, you know, Dr. Thibodeau and myself, uh, we're from uh, Lamar University. Um, I'm up in, in North Vancouver, Canada. It's, uh, it's dark out there. Do you see that? It's black. <laughs> it's totally dark. Calissa, is, it sun, is there sunlight where you're at? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So um, some of you know us from the DLL program, and um, you know for those who um, haven't met us, you know we've been working in in digital learning and leading for a long time. I've been teaching online for a long time. Uh, we want to encourage you to keep calm and keep on learning on. That's a key thing. Um, we also want to remind you that we think you're doing a good job, and regardless of what's happening with the online dynamic, this remote learning, you know, the the crisis that the pandemic has spawned, research is pretty clear on this. John Hattie's research, I think, can be extended to the digital realm. He makes the argument, just as long as you're not hurting students, either physically or mentally, guess what? Almost anything you can do can help them learn. The key is to figure out those things that are can help them learn the most. We have some arguments about what we think those key things are, feedback, authentic learning, but we'll, we'll get into that. So we think you're doing a good job and we want to sort of augment what you're doing with some of our ideas. So you're doing good work. Also, AJ Giuliani, I grabbed this tweet yesterday or the day before, and he says, the, good, the bad news is there's no instructional manual for this. But the good news is there's no instructional manual, which means we get to make it up as we go along. <laughs> for people like me, the delusional optimist, this is good stuff. I always like to make it up as I go along. But the reality is, I think all of you are recognizing we haven't done this before. This has never happened before, this type of a scenario. And yet, I think there are things that we have done before that we can you know, find useful. So we, we did ask you to watch a video. I, we heard some of you might not have watched it. It's okay, you'll get to talk to your colleagues. It's about using authentic learning opportunities. Your colleagues will, will help bring you into the discussion. So we're, we're going to actually break you into uh, breakout rooms where you're gonna introduce yourself. And we want you to discuss some of the key insights from the video about the whole notion of changing that focus to authentic learning. Dr. Thibodeau or Calissa is gonna break you into breakout rooms and, and uh, and then you're going to talk to each other and you're going to come back. Okay, so here we go. You'll get a little button to join your room. And uh, I think I have it set to about three per room. And uh, just we'll pull you back in about three, four minutes. All right. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Decided to hang out in one of the breakout rooms this time, see what it's like. <laughs> oh. It's fun. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I also want I also want to see if the recording is going to pick up is if it's going to follow my camera. That's the other thing. Oh, that's that's the other a good tip. idea. So right right now, Talissa is going. Oh, where did we go? What's he doing? What's going on? Because <laughs> well, I'm experimenting. <laughs> so, anyways, thoughts. Authentic learning. It's tough to do. Do you think, or do you think your your colleagues can get it? I think it's um, for for me from from my position. You know what I do. It's I can see it a lot more. I find that my colleagues in the classroom find it difficulty. It's like sporadic kind of authentic learning. It's like they'll teach their content, they'll get all the way, and then they'll come up with an authentic learning opportunity at the end of the of the learning, um, that kind of thing. So, um, but uh, it's not like an ongoing kind of thing, and that's not always, but work in progress. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm in a fortunate spot. Um, 
you know, I've been doing the, the influencing end for five years. Uh, so when, when this all happened and we had meetings, uh, like, A, I was confident to be like the leader. Um, you know, even though I'm a small, small school district, like our ratio is tight. Like, so I'm responsible for 150 staff members. Like I don't have tech support. I don't have ed tech coaches. Like, um, so it was kind of like I was built for it and I was ready to roll. And I was like, remember the stuff I told you to do five years ago? Remember when I told you, <laughs> like I was, pull, I was pulling screencasts of explaining programs that were three and four years old. And I was like, I have to make new ones. It looks different. It's been updated. Like it's not the same. Um, but I think because of that, uh, you know, and Dr. H, you know, we always said like, you know, you, you appeal through their heart and like, you know, sincerity and things like that. There has to be that emotional connection. And I feel that through this process, my, myself and my admin team, we've been very supportive of our staff from the emotional sense of like knowing that their families, they're, they're at home. Like a lot of my staff has kids. Like I have a very young staff. Um, and so if they're worrying about their families and things, because of that connection, people know they have to do this. Like I told them, I was like, this is what we have to do. Like, and um, like I have teachers now emailing me, look, I just, I got screened. Like uh, one of my Wilson certified teachers sent, sent me an email, said I'm trying my best. And she basically took a course on her own on how to best utilize Screencastify. Mm. For, so, um, like it's like little little wins like that I think are gonna like I'm also optimistic maybe six months from now, like when all this clears, like everyone's gonna have the, the a, a basic understanding where you won't have to train as much and it's gonna be more this is why we can do it now in addition to our classroom experiences. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Boy, you just gave me an idea for another session where we can talk about this idea that do you really need to train people for that? I've been experimenting there uh, with with some of the face-to-face -face workshops I do, and I've been replicating a, um, a Harvard study where you had two groups. One group did the traditional lecture-based idea. The other group had active learning. And, it, you know, this is something that we should talk about. I think I think Dr. Thibodeau and I will share um, a session. I've got a turning to the main hey. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Interesting how it broke you out automatically and put you all into. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well. So I, I imagine, Alyssa, you were wondering, oh, where did Dwayne go? Yeah, I hung out in the room. I want to see if the recording actually picked that up. I, I think it'll be interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting. So, uh, folks, thoughts. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Chad um, and and Jamie had some interesting things, and I think Chad mentioned a point about. Can we can we extend this? Do you want to just mention that, Chad? This whole idea of after the crisis is over, can we carry it over? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've communicated with my staff. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm from New Jersey, so uh, I think like 350 people died yesterday. So it's uh, okay. like in regards to how we're connecting with our staff, we're we're really worrying about their emotional selves first and you know, through the DLL program, we always talked about how you had to appeal to the, like the mind and the heart, like you had to get that emotional connection. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've worked where I've worked for 13 years. Um, and I've been like, quote unquote, influencer for the last five. So I was explaining to Dr. H and Jamie that I've been putting out screencasts that are three, four years old of that. I used, I told you about this already. I told you about this already. And now people are like, yeah, like we, we realize that we probably should have, and now they're taking it on themselves to, to figure things out. Um, but I've already communicated to my building because I'm actually an assistant principal and a chief academic officer. I have two jobs. But um, so I told my pre-K through three, dust settles. You're all going to now be able to use this platform in addition to your instruction, which is what I feel like we've always like. That's the, been the goal. I, I, you know, there there there's, there may be some online charter schools, but I don't think anyone really wants their elementary kids to to do this unless they choose to, right? Like homeschooling. So if if public education now, and and I only know this 
in my state, but you know, I had a meeting yesterday with a lot, a lot of decision makers. Um, like everyone's shifting their funding to like, if you didn't have devices before you're going to have them now. If you didn't have mobile hotspots before you're going to have them now. Um, so I think that is going to hopefully be the, you know, the silver lining through all of this. Um, because I think people not only are thrust into it, but some people are realizing that it is an opportunity for them to be a, become a better educator. Great. Thanks. Other thoughts, other thoughts, folks. Yeah, I have a thought on that. The unfortunate thing is why does it take a crisis to kind of move in that direction? You know, I kind of was hoping that we would move in that direction a bit earlier, but mm -hmm. that's the reality. I mean, that's my only thought on that. That's a good point though, Chad. I, I appreciate your insight. Yeah, I feel like I'm already seeing a backlash by some more traditional teachers that are that are just lecturing or maybe their students are writing handwritten essays on camera screenshotting um and are going to say after this like yeah okay fine i can do it either way but technology doesn't help or hurt um mm -hmm. because when it's forced uh, in a similar vein there's this article here that's uh, a little bit more um it's got some more extreme language like it's unethical to to teach at this time so it's a little bit more extreme but it does talk about how this isn't online learning. It's not distance because those exist. Those there's frameworks for those. And you know, when you make an online class, it's difficult. It takes a lot of time. So we're not making online classes now. And if to call it that, I think it's going to leave a bad taste in some people's mouths to say, yeah. like, well, we already did that. And our kids were fine. Even though mm -hmm. I didn't really, you know what I mean? Um, That's what I was worried about too. Like they are forcing gonna say, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were going to think this is it. This is what it's supposed to look like. And it's not. Yeah. So I agree with you on that one. It's so funny because that was my blog post this morning <clears throat> that this is not distance learning. It is not <clears throat> homeschooling. It's somewhere it's forced upon you. It's not a choice. It's not something you planned for. It's not something you created. It's, it's just there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's Torch's kind of article been... was mentioned calling it like an emergency plan or like just like teaching with COVID. Like just, let's just remove the terminology because I think all of us are excited and like, Hey, this could be an amazing time. But at the same time, there's people that are scared and, and literally, you know, I had a math teacher that was like, I don't know how I'm going to give a test. And we were like, maybe don't give a test. He's like, well, I have to, if I have to give a test, how do you, and we're like, don't, don't give a test. So it was really, it's just hard. I mean, I think it's harder than we, for us, you know, it's a little bit easier and it's hard to shift that perspective. Maybe. It's uh, kind of interesting. I received a message yesterday late from my friend who is a professor out in Okinawa and he said everything shut down and he did his same degree program as I did he said everybody's in a crisis situation now we've got all of a sudden he's like I'm updating my Moodle server and I'm trying to get all these things ready to go and he said I just don't know you know they start their year I think April 2nd April 3rd is when their year starts you know so they're they run differently than we do in the US and he said all of these professors are trying to figure out how to turn their lectures and put them online. He said, and the problem I'm having is students are already falling asleep in class when we're lecturing and lecturing. So <clears throat> they're seeing this over there, even in Japan, where all, you know, this trickled down even faster than over here as an opportunity to just put my lectures online. And this is where we have to kind of, I think, help them see there's another way to do this. I know he sees this, but I know that some of the people he's dealing with, he's really nervous about how this is going to translate into, you know, what we're talking about because and his question to me was, well, well, you know, how much effort should I put into this right now, not knowing where this is going to go? And I started thinking, hey, this is an opportunity for you to really stand out and show some blended learning and, you know, pave the pathway here. This is what you studied to do, right? So I think he's thinking about this a little bit differently after our conversation. But I know this is not just here in the U.S. or, you know, in Texas or in the U.S. I mean, it, it's bigger than, than we realize. And I think we need to... Um, do more outreach things like this to, to connect with people and help, help them see that, like you said, Creighton, giving it to us, you don't have to do this right now. And going back to Chad's thought, we need to take care of our teachers and give them time to be able to change, you know, learn this and, and um, push on the buttons and what does this do and be inquisitive about it, right? Um, we need to give them time and, and understanding in that way, and I respect that. So I'm hoping that I can help him through this. Just a so, thought I had. 
So on that note, um, I want to sort of pull some of the ideas together and, and just run through a couple of thoughts. And then we're, we're going to break out again, have another discussion. And we're going to actually, this is what we're going to do all morning. We're going to be talking, sharing ideas. Because isn't that what yeah. technology is for? To come together and share <laughs> ideas? <laughs> it's not for me to deliver content. Although, okay, I'll give you a little mm -hmm. content. Right. So, um, but really what I'm doing is I'm sort of planting some seeds and I'm sharing some ideas. And so um, I think it's important that, that, you know, in this type of environment, I'm trying to model some things that you might want to look at doing. So <clears throat> I would argue that there's no shortage of resources. And, and, and I, I opened up my email today and, oh man, there's just, everybody is sending you this amazing list that's everywhere, right? And, <laughs> and there are people who are like AJ Giuliani and others who are saying, yeah, this isn't distance learning. This is remote, you know, disaster recovery type you know, education. There's no shortage of resources. They're absolutely everywhere. We have some at Lamar University. When you go to the website, there's spreadsheets, there's different blogs. Everybody, every association is pointing to stuff. George Koros and AJ Giuliani, all these people are pointing to good stuff. Yeah, they're trying to sell you their books too, but hey, they, you, why, why waste a good crisis, right? But the reality is there's no silver bullet. And so I think, you know, I was hearing from Chad and other people here in the conversation that, you know, maybe some of your people are thinking, I'll, I'll get through this and just give me a quick fix. Give me something I can do. Sure, I'll use Screencast and Mac or I'll do this or I'll do that. We're looking for that silver bullet. I, I, I don't think it exists. We have to be really, really careful. Um, now, I, I want to tell you about a bonus that we have at the end. And for those who took in the session yesterday, don't spoil my surprise, but <laughs> it's a cool bonus. <laughs> What we do have is a shortage of focus and context. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I wanted you to watch that, that video about that change of focus to think about the fact that we want to have people doing real stuff, students doing real stuff and authentic learning opportunities. And we're going to talk about some of those in just a couple of minutes here and some examples. I've got a list of examples that can be used in elementary to higher ed, but maybe more towards the, the high school. Um, you know, those authentic learning opportunities can provide the context and help. And if you can change your focus a bit to look at those opportunities and then create the context in, in the learning. So don't take my word for it. There's evidence. There's, there's been a ton of evidence for this. This this article is in the resources section. Authentic learning is one of the key things to effective online learning. You know, you want to use media technology for creation, not for delivery. Students want to do real stuff together. They want to collaborate. They want to become self-directed. They actually want to take control. They do. Research is clear on that. And ideally, we want to look at ourselves as coaches, not necessarily content deliverers. Now, this is a hard message to get over to your colleagues, right? But the reality is, is that we, we want to be those guides on the side. I think Jamie had mentioned that yesterday. So it's important. And and you know th this lecture hall, which we might have seen in our classrooms, now changed. We, we we can turn a lecture hall into you know a virtual lecture hall through Zoom, but we don't want to do that because our kids they want to do stuff in the real world. They want to use technology to solve real problems, whether it's biking scenarios. I use my boys as an example. Um, everything. The whole world's information is available to us in our palms or hands, whether you use an iPad or a mobile device or an iPhone. We can access information. You don't need to deliver information. And, and students, they don't want to make a Prezi. They don't want to start a blog. They don't want to create Wordles or do a, a Animoto or you know, a Kahoot or use a whiteboard or to develop app. No, no, they want to drive change. They want to take action. They want to make a difference. They want to do something significant. They want to find answers. That's the key thing. They want to start conversations. So um, the reason I, this is important is that I've been doing a lifelong experiment on, on authentic learning. And I've been using everything from planning trips, documentaries, investigations, doing science as opposed to learning science. And this can be done at all levels. And Chad's going to talk a little bit more about perhaps an elementary focus. But um, I've actually done all these things even at the elementary level. Connecting with communities. You can get kids on Skype, on BlueJeans, on, on Zoom to maybe talk to people across the world. Even in, even in elementary uh, level, you can have kids doing that with guidance and direction. Getting students to actually you know, engage in the e-portfolios. And maker spaces can happen if you're fortunate enough to have a kitchen, a garage, a shop, or a basement. Computational thinking can happen in a day-to-day -day setting. And the reason this is important is that I have a real-life example in my longitudinal study. My boys' projects have gotten big. They're a little bit more expensive. My older son is a professional downhill mountain bike racer and an enduro racer. And you know, one of the challenges you face when you do authentic learning with your kids is that they're going to grow up different. You know, my, my boys are still doing what they did when they were kids. They're still riding bikes right? But they're getting paid for it. And my younger son is still playing with cars, 
but he's got his, a business where he builds these custom cars. So a, a lifetime of authentic learning right from elementary school on up enabled them to actually make a bit of a, a difference in, in their world, right? So your authentic learning idea. So Chad, you, you, you wanted to jump in and, and provide a perspective before we break into another breakout room. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you're back. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems when I'm muted, when I unmute, it, I have to refresh it a few times. Um, uh. So the, the one thing that I commented on yesterday when we had our second breakout after Dr. H's presentation was that um, authentic learning examples that we usually provide are, are self-motivated, self-driven, usually with um, like someone, a teenager, high school age or, or beyond. Like for example, we're self-motivated by participating right now in, the, in this session when all of us are probably also responsible for other things in the schools that we work in. Um, so with, with younger kids, and, and I work with preschool through sixth graders, um, you know, before this, we had a lot of things going on and set up in regards to authentic learning experiences, including what I think um, is the easiest one to maybe continue, which was a lot of community service-based projects. Um, for example, one that's happening right now, we had a teacher who's fostering dogs during this crisis and realized that the, the, the company provided all of these toys and some of them were um, kind of like homemade. So she created a video on how to make the toys and is going to post it um, to our district Facebook page to encourage students to then make their own dog toys, to then mail them to the collection agency that they can go out to the fosters. Um, so the, the, the tricky part where we got into the conversations yesterday was that that's great. And like, that's where like, I am optimistic. I, I I'll come up with ideas day after day. The tricky part is there's probably 15% of your population whose parent isn't going to show their kid the Facebook video that isn't going to let them make that dog toy. That's not going to buy a stamp or a, bo or a postage box to mail it back out. Um, so, you know, then we try to think, well, what can you do that to make that equitable? Um, can they draw a picture? Can they talk about what their idea would be? Um, and I think that's where we've evolved at my level with our younger students. Our, all of our kindergartners do take a class called Innovations in Design, um, where they, they do physical-based coding things. They do problem-solving activities. They do, you know, they did the, the whole, like, catch a leprechaun, and they, they had to build something out of materials within their house. Um, you know, we talked about yesterday um, the, the chalk the walk I think Dr. T talked about that. I've seen that a lot. Um, our art teacher is doing um, butterflies because butterflies, I believe, symbolize endurance. Um, and we need endurance through this process. So we sent out a global to our families to be creative, make your own butterflies. So from an elementary standpoint, I think the authentic is um, really lowering your expectations in regards to most times in a school at younger age, there's always an adult there to help them. Um, whereas in this scenario, there may not be an adult there to help them, even if they do have access to the information. Um, so that I think that's the part where it's, it's very possible, but you just wanna make sure you keep your expectations I don't want to say minimal, but, and, and, and like realistic is even a hard word to use, but you, you want to keep your expectations, I think, fun and, and motivating. So if you know that kids will like to do something and then you can provide different options, like I feel like the arts right now are, are what everyone's doing. Everyone's crafting, everyone's making slime, everyone's doing, a, a, you know, some type of project if, if they have access to those things. And, and I've told my staff, um, you know, because they are concerned. They have parents that haven't responded to an email in two weeks. They have kids that haven't posted anything to their seesaw. You know, that's my job to worry about it. That's like what I'll do. I just keep telling them, do your best. Like if you, like whatever you prepare, if you do get three parents emailing you back, thank you, this helped so much, or it was a family activity that we enjoyed, um, then that's, I think that's what we get out of this. The, the negatives are going to, happen unfortunately and it's going to be something that's going to really come to light out out of this not that we didn't know about inequities in education before but you know 
I, I know we still have school districts in New Jersey and we're, we're pretty on point. Like most schools are one-to-one -one, like, and have been, but there are some schools that are doing paper packets during this process. Kids are picking kids up, are. kids mm -hmm. are picking up packets. Um, so they're not even doing digital learning. They're, they're, they're literally picking up work and, and doing it. Well, listen, I, I really appreciate your perspective, and I think this is a wonderful segue. We're going to break out into another uh, breakout session so we have a chance to talk in smaller groups about ways that we can mitigate this. And I really appreciate the fact that you're talking about having realistic expectations. And I think that's a good term, being, being realistic about what can be done and making that progress. So we're going to break out for a few minutes again, talk about uh, these authentic learning ideas and prime the pump, and then we'll come back and continue this conversation with the whole group. So, uh, Talissa, if you want okay. to... So I'm going to click this recreate button and I'm oh, going to see if we can mix, just mix up the group. You're going to mix this up. Ah. <laughs> hey, hmm, what does this button do? Here we go. <laughs> yeah, okay. It mixed everybody up. Dr. Rich here. Different. Here we go. Oh, oh cool. <laughs> Crazy group. <laughs> yeah. I like that feature, though. I really want to start using it. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it really makes a difference. Mike, have you ever played with Zoom and, and this breakout room functionality? Not the breakout rooms, no. Yeah, it. I, I've been using it for quite a while. Um, I, I also teach at other institutions, and I do I do face to face workshops, and I found that I, I break people into tables and and the breakout. And so once I realized Zoom could do this, I started doing this online with Zoom, and it, it just changes the dynamic of the room. You know, people it, come together. Yeah, it, it's fun. It, it definitely does. Like I was excited to see number one who I was going to be matched with. <laughs> you know, getting different getting different opinions. Um, it, it raised my level of accountability, like be prepared for the breakout room. Oh my God, what do I got to do? What's the question? Like I'm really paying attention versus mm -hmm. doing 25 other things. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that, that's one of the big, big things is keeping everybody engaged because you know, there's all the other things going on. There is. And that's, you know, that was the big thing that popped up to me when all this started Twitter came alive with 4,000 people, you know, just millions of things hitting. Everybody's got something to say. And there's just this deluge of information. And then my wife and I, she teaches middle school drama and I teach high school and putting together things for the kids. And she had them do a video just saying what, how they feel about things and all of that. And then I got looking and her for most of her kids it was the fifth video they had done of that same thing but they all had slightly different things they had to do so they couldn't turn in the same video they couldn't do the video once and turn it in five times they had to make five different videos that were all slightly different but the same thing and just that there's that whole deluge of just all of these things that are happening and everybody's kind of doing you know the kids are getting hammered my sister teaches um she's she teaches and then has elementary kids and was noticing some of that, even with the elementary teachers that, you know, if the, if, it, if the, the teacher would do, if she had one teacher, they were doing the same thing. But when they broke to like um, her oldest has math science with one and then another with another, and there was conflicting activities, they were all doing the same things over and over again, um, which made it interesting. It was just a interesting dynamic that came out of that. So the people trying to do things that are creative for the kids, but the, so it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. I, I have a term for that. Um, it, and this is in the, in the literature, it's called activity fatigue or software fatigue, right? Everybody finds the same tool and everybody uses the same tool. It's like you have to be really careful with discussions. And so with these digital tools, everybody wants to do the same thing. So like you said, five, five kids are making the same video. You know, it'd be interesting to have those teachers come together and the five kids go across a curriculum and make a video that fits all five of their subjects. Wouldn't that be a yeah. better thing to do? That's what right? I was thinking. Yeah. 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 So that's, it, the, the, that's where you really take advantage of the opportunity. Have five right? kids make one video. Oh yeah. Or do, mm -hmm. you know, uh, do a mashup, right? The, the yeah. opportunities are. Interesting. I know that nobody comes back early. Everybody waits till they get kicked out. <laughs> love what is that? To the last moment of a voice gets cut off. <laughs> and, and I just want to—I just wanted to say to us. <laughs> it's a love—it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> it's so great to hear from like-minded people. Like 
ah, like you get it. <laughs> Here we are. Yes. Sure. Awesome. Uh, Mike and Sue were talking about activity fatigue that everybody now, everybody's getting the same assignment. So Mike, do you want to just share the whole idea that, that five kids have to make five of the same videos and there's a yeah, better they, way? Um, my wife, she teaches middle school drama and it seemed that all of the kids, all the teachers, they were all posting that they had their kids make a video, tell how they're feeling and what they're experiencing, what they're doing. But the kids all had seven of those with slightly different requirements in each one. So they made seven of the same video or made the same video seven times. They couldn't use, make one video and then right. done with it. It became a thing to do. Not, it, it became, it wasn't authentic anymore. Right. It wasn't authentic. It was a response. Yeah. Yeah. Activity, yeah, we, activity fatigue. Yeah. And we, we suggested that instead get those teachers across the curriculum one video and have kids integrate it hmm. sorry go ahead mm -hmm. no i was going to say i would i don't know how many uh have the ability to influence like the or they're part of the decision making process what we did was like for something like that we changed we re re reinvented our schedule so we essentially said the entire district does these classes on these days um and then the grade levels had to break out within themselves and if you you before the closure if you were on the same point on a scope and sequence you all pushed out the same information and you took turns who made the videos this way you also would share the load of like your your planning and things but if you were ahead or behind you had to personalize it to your students um just based off of like where you would you didn't want to have like what you just said you didn't want to have kids doing the same the same things that they were already done before Jump in, folks. This is your time. This is your time to come together, share ideas, talk. We're investigating. We're exploring. So, how are we going to how are we going to save the world here? Go ahead. I think with um, authentic learning experiences, a lot of times we think of community involvement, and now that most of that community is going to be online, at least for the foreseeable future, for the end of this semester, for most of us, that's been daunting. I started a unit all based on UN sustainability goals because it's all in Spanish. They have all like this really un, uh, like comprehensible Spanish. So we were started right before spring break. It was like, you're going to actually create a product. It could be a prototype. I don't, you know, we was really getting to design. And then now it's like, do we do the same thing and just say, what would you do? Do we, you know, I've had some kids that are kind of trying to do things online, but um, I think the authentic part of it has been pulled away from some of it. Um, mm -hmm. To keep it all to keep it in Spanish, like that's my concern. Um, hmm. Even if it's just minimally in Spanish, so that has been a little bit um, difficult. But the students all came back, and I said, like, do you want me to just push my curriculum? I, I had a big feedback day yesterday and the day before, and most students were saying, like, we get why project-based learning works, especially now, like they're really competitive, so they don't want to get something where they could cheat because they know someone would cheat. So they were all talking about like. We want to do a project let's figure this out so the cool thing is that they're pushing me and each other to figure out how to keep doing it um in an authentic way ah. but um I, it's my struggle whereas i could easily just do a couple completion based assignments each week and sit back um mm -hmm. so i'm just kind of writing that balance that a lot of teachers are of like mm -hmm. how much do i do how much do they do um, gosh but it has I love really that example. communication so that's i really love that think about what you're which you post for them to do an authentic, real, you know, problem to solve, and they have to do it in Spanish, and then they have to figure out how to take this and do it digitally. The layers there, that's really cool. And if you're open enough, like you said, it's not about completion, it's about navigating through that mess of what we call learning. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, hey, if it's a little uncomfortable for those kids, good for them. They're, they're going to learn, learn and take more out of that. You got to have drop in some reflective, you know, reflections for those yeah, kids I, as a, in Spanish. I mentioned like a, a learning log. I don't know. How, I was like, don't start it yet. Cause I don't know how I'm going to even yeah. process that, but be thinking about it. And then I just started cracked open a book that I got at TCA that's blended or balanced with blended learning. And the first chapter is about grading and grading mm -hmm. did not be about the product, but the process. So I'm kind of mm -hmm. going to just use this opportunity to supersede what, how we do grades in our district and, um, Mm. Right on the process. Hopefully, we'll see 
comes out of it. I think Dr. H and I, you know, in the DLL program, we do a lot of that. We look and we go back and revisit, look again, help out. How can we help you? How can we get where you want to be? Not necessarily where we want you to be, mm -hmm. right? And that's the perspective. We go back and we look many iterations. And that's not something typical. I don't think it happens in a lot of institutions. But I think what's really helped for people that are trying to do things like this is our district said, don't worry about what they're not going to learn. Even though they've said that, our superintendent said, mm -hmm. whatever they're gonna miss, don't worry about it. Just do things that you think are valuable. So that's been a huge weight lifted off a lot of teachers' shoulders. So like, mm -hmm. now I'm not even worried about the product. I'm just, I am more. So it, it, it is challenging a lot of philosophies. And then now we're worried about, okay, now we're gonna go back to August and mm -hmm. we're tested by this date. So I think that's maybe another conversation, but. I think that speaks a little bit to what Chad's talking about too, going back to the equity thing, because if we, if we layer all that, they're going to be able to do what they can with the tools that they have, mm -hmm. whether that's an iPhone or that's an outdoor, you know, project, sidewalk chalk, whatever that may be, they're going to, they're, they're still going to learn. Um, but it, again, it may not be what we are thinking they're going to learn, but it, you know, so that's a tough one. Navigating through this is a tough one, yeah. but I think that, yeah. The, the one thing I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to, um, Carl, um, I, I wanted to just get a, a check in with you because you've been working specifically in the area of projects within uh, social studies. And, and you know, uh, I, I what are you doing? I, I want to hear a little bit. You know, I, I was hoping to get put into your room to hear what you're up to. So if you could share with us, uh, I, I'd like to hear your perspective. Yeah. And that, um, you know, it started talking with, uh, guys in, in my room and um we got kicked out so early <laughs> but um no it uh, what I, i'm exclusively project based that's our whole class and um and so that's been a, a real challenge because i'm used to just telling my students you know information is we, we don't hold any information back we're not trying to help them here's the information go learn it you know or anything it's, it's go do something with it be creative and make something with it and um and so, because we are concerned with the pro the process and not not necessarily the product, and and so that's been that's what my kids do. That that's their whole um, that's the whole class. And so we've been uh, kind of. Um, Jeff, I, I told a friend a couple of weeks ago we're going to start distance you know middle ages distance learning now because we we're sending out <laughs> packets and all of our assignments for every world history student or for every world geography student are exactly the same across the campus. Oh, that's, um, that's yeah. a little, yeah. And that's so frustrating to me because that's not what my kids are used to. And, um, and so we just have to kind of, you know, my, my challenge is how do I supplement the work that I'm having to send out, you know, because they're my kid, what, what the, what we were told to do is the assignments for the week need to be able to be completed in an hour. Okay. Um, so the stuff that we're sending out, my kids are doing in 20 minutes and they're sending it back going, what else? What else would you like me to do? And so now we're just having to, I mean, it, it's kind of cool because we get to ask challenging questions and say, all right, what, what would you do with this? How would you uh, approach this? And, 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 you know, one of the things I'm talking about with my world history students uh, this next week is looking at, uh, looking at government, and I had a conversation with a friend yesterday who, who said, um, you know, if, if you wanted to shut down a government, this is do it. Um, you know, if you wanted to institute martial law with someone, this is exactly the process that you would do it. And, and so we're going to ask those questions and um, we'll see what happens there. But that's, uh, you know, Dr. H, that's really my frustration right now is how do I keep doing what I'm used to doing when when, when my district is saying, well, this is what you're going to do now. Mm -hmm. Everything that we're going to do is with you, and that's... Control. That's Yikes. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, that's the same thing. My, my kids have a blanket second grade curriculum. That, yeah. that The packet is for all the three elementary schools. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, how do, how do you do that? When one would be ahead, there's different, you know, you know, heterogeneous groups. Like, how, how is... I don't know. Well, and my, my situation, it's a little bit different because we, my, my teaching partner and I are, um, are a little bit of an aberration in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're the only people, as far as I know, in the district who are doing exclusively project-based. There, uh, there are other teachers in, in some other um, classes who will bring projects in, but, um, 
but I mean, we, we a hundred percent, the project is the learning, you know, the project's not an addition to, it actually is the learning. Yeah. And so that's, that's the challenge right now for us is, um, because we are outliers in our district, we we're having to, um, conform to what everybody else is, is having to do, I guess is the better word. Mm -hmm. That's frustrating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't was going to have any wisdom or insight there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to comment on the with with kids not uh, maybe getting to everything that you would expect them to. The one comment I made, uh, I kind of stole part of it from from somewhere I read, but I told my whole staff, everyone is in the same boat. That's yeah. that's the only so that's the only thing that we can realize is, um, you know, every first grader that's going to second grade, the last formalized data we have is probably from their, their March benchmark for their, you know, FMP and their kindergarten map screening. Like right. we, everyone's going to be the same. So what I'm planning for placement is um, like basically one-on-one -on -one interviews with our teachers and to discuss each and every kid in their class um, and basically collect feedback on how they've been participating in the digital process. And then I'll use the hard data I have from before because the reality is um, kids coming into kindergarten aren't getting preschool experience right now. Um, kids in first grade aren't getting kindergarten experience right now. So like the, those are huge milestone years that um, the, the tricky part is everyone's going to be in the same boat. So we'll, it's going to be more of how do you redesign next year um, in my thought, like, like next year's projects for you, Carl, may be different. And then because of how like the kids that are going to come to you all did this packet from last year. Right. So I think that's going to be the real, the, the real thing to tackle next year. And then the year after that, and, and I read somewhere that someone said, we should follow this entire cohort of, of people for 20 years and see where they all end up at different ages in their life. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, well, you know, you're in a position, Chad, where you can make those decisions, you know, which is great, you know, because you can hold on to, to the, the to the notion of what, it, what it would be to digitally learn. Mm -hmm. I, I get nervous for districts that don't have that. And they're like, we're doing this now and this is it and now throw it away because we're back at school again and let's go mm -hmm. back to normal normal um because that's what we're comfortable with and i that's what i i fear when you're not when we you don't have a say like carl says you kind of have to go with whatever they say mm -hmm. i'm nervous for that i'm mm -hmm. nervous for that. yeah yeah i mean my best advice is um like i miss the classroom immensely i miss teaching however the reason i went through the digital learning and leading is because I wanted to be a leader. Um, and the way I did that was being loud and basically making good points that made myself indispensable. So like right now, I don't, I don't like it. My superintendent isn't doing shit, but it's because, sorry, I said, I said a bad word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but she, she, she's a good leader because she is delegated to us our responsibilities and she trusts us to do what's best for, for, for our kids and for our families. So, you know, in a sense, I'm mad because I'm not getting a lot of um, like feedback from her, but at the same time, I have complete power to, to make these types of decisions. So I think that's the part, like if you're still in the classroom and you want to become some type of leader, um, if you make good points, like Carl, you're making good points, great, and you're making good points. Like if you have a desire, they'll hear you, um, and that's how. That's the whole point of being an influencer. Even if you remain in the classroom, but you may not. Yesterday, we had people that are teachers, but they're invited to certain meetings because their their opinions are valid and they've been heard by their administration team. Mm -hmm. Excellent points, yeah. Sarah. Did you uh, you you've been taking this in just thoughts i uh i have been and chad i just wanted to uh, that's what i was typing in the chat i was like hey listen you might want to call that a blessing that she's not saying anything because <laughs> we've kind of gone back and forth um here we are a very small district i am a very small district we are all in one building um k through 12 pre-k through 12 
Um, but we have been down that road where the superintendent had to be our principal for a amount of time. And so her coming back out of that reins and back into the superintendent job has been very, very difficult for everyone because of the micromanaging at the building level. So I would say it sounds like you know exactly what you need for your for your people and for your kids. So just go with it. And I think um, if you want to twist it and spin it in a positive way, that maybe she has so much confidence in what you're doing that she doesn't need to tell you anything. So um, you sound very confident, by the way. So. <laughs> I'm going to jump in and say, if, if you need a boost, Chad, job well done. You're moving in the right direction, yeah. I think. Yeah. You know, one, one positive thing I've seen coming out of a lot of conversations is people are starting to ask that question again. What's most important to learn? Not what was the thing I was doing? There's been a lot of, well, they, they just need this. I need to make sure they get this. They'll be fine next year if they don't get anything else but this one thing. And that's at least a good conversation to start with because it's going to make people then next year they go back and like, well, last year you said this was the only the thing. This was the most important thing. Why are we doing this thing now? <laughs> yeah, that's that. That's some of the conversations I had with students and a couple of teachers is, OK, if you were there's a math teacher that is notorious in 10th grade and I'm the 10th grade advisor kind of. So they vent to me about this teacher and I said, okay, you're no longer sitting in her class for 80 minutes every other day, but she is not, she has not stopped. She's same expectation, same amount of work, maybe even a little bit more. Oh um, do you guys think you're learning? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. We're learning. And I was like, well, how many, how many hours a week are you spending on math? And it was way less than the amount of time they were sitting in class. So we had that conversation of like, what, what are you doing in class all day? And in my class, what are we, what are we even doing all day? Like if we only have one thing per class or per week to learn, why are we spending hours in the same building together? Like, what are we doing? And I think, you know, I challenge my students to think about that so that next year, maybe they can start challenging teachers. Um, and it's also a better selling point. Instead of having a bad taste in people's mouths, we can tell teachers like, look, your students learned, here's some things that they did learn and they were, one hour a week or two hours a week or whatever the minimum standards were. So those are really good positive conversations and they're challenging, but um, hopefully that's a positive going into next year. Mm -hmm. Going back, most of us are just going to go back into a normal schedule probably unless this situation continues. Well, I think I, with that, like there's going to be things that we're going to reallocate funding for like for example we purchased uh seesaw premium for preschool kindergarten first grade i bought a, I bought a three-year license so i was like I, like i'm not going to just buy it for the 60-day trial like we're going to get it and you're going to use it from now on um because essentially it will like parents are learning how to use it now the kids are learning how to use it now so why not take advantage of that like mm -hmm. we've joked we're never going to have a snow day again um, and, and, I hope not. That'd be and, nice. And the the ironic thing, and I, I said this to my wife last night, like in um, my career as a as an educator or as a student, this is the first time in New Jersey we, we my school district never had a snow day or delayed opening ever. Me too. Yay. So yeah. of course we then have a pandemic. So That's true. Um, I, I I really miss snow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what what i'm hoping is that the the things that go well are able to translate and continue mm -hmm. into learning mm -hmm. um and by you saying that we didn't just do the free version the 60-day version we're going to commit to this and this is how we want to connect home to school um I'm just curious as to how many people feel, and a couple of you said something, that wherever we're doing in this time period, regardless of how long or short it is, it will end when the epidemic or the pandemic ends. That, yeah. That's very unsettling. That's very scary. Um, quick thought here. Jennifer, you've been kind of quiet back there. What are your thoughts on all this? <laughs> um, I, like I said before, I'm just – Happy to have some like-minded conversations here. <laughs> um, just that, I, as I just wrote that in the quote though, um, if we're only supposed to be learning one thing a day or if that's the most important part, what, what are we spending so much time on? Why, 
why can't the kids get more project-based learning and we don't, we don't have time for the 45 minutes for genius hour we're doing genius hour this time to this time why why if you just narrowed it down to that time but i know why uh, yeah i know why because we have taught kids how to go to school yeah. i the adult tell you tell you tell you you the child spit it back and we repeat tell tell spit spit tell tell <laughs> so now when you ask them to learn on their own mm -hmm. i can't do it i don't know how to stand on my own two feet i, I find okay that's a good point because i was thinking of something earlier and you might dispute me on this and feel free to do so but if we tell our teachers exactly what to do and how to do it then guess what they're reliant upon the system just like our students are reliant upon them mm -hmm. and i think if we don't give them that professional right to be creative and try some things yeah they might band together yeah they might do the same things two three teachers or a grade level but to get to, to move away from the just the content delivery model and maybe doing a, a little bit more what carl's talking about maybe that's a next year thing we have to give them time and give them some opportunities to play experiment and grow so where they are now i doubt next year they'll be the same especially if they have leads like chad who can influence them that way and i think that even in the classroom as chad was talking about you have a way to influence everybody around you if you're doing something different like what carl's talking about mm -hmm. what creighton's doing <laughs> the opportunities are there it's just a matter of helping people see that go there try that try experiment new culture it. of learning mm -hmm. off my shtick <laughs> no, I, I think that i'm sorry go ahead. i good carl i i do have a uh, point well, but I, I was gonna i'm say, watching the time too but go ahead yeah i, I was going to say that um exactly what dr Thibodeau was just talking about when we stopped telling our students what to make and um and started giving them information and said make something and they are the ones who banded together themselves and they were the ones who were then able to express their creativity. So I, I love taking that same idea and moving it to the teachers instead of telling them what to do, say, here, go do something. And then, yeah, you're right. There might be pockets of teachers do the exact same thing, but they came up with it on their own and they decided that's how they wanted to. But if they embrace the, we are all learners. Absolutely. Mindset, yeah. That's what we are right now. We're yeah. all learning. So whether it's a, a, a seven year old or uh, a 40 year old, a 50 year old, we're still all learners. We, none yeah. of us have it right, but some of us are moving in a positive direction. And that needs to start rippling out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And with our parents. I didn't hear that, what was that? I said say, same with our parents. We need to let them know that they're learning also. Like We're all learners. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've probably seen me grinning like a Cheshire cat here, the terminology, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation. And our goal was to bring people together to enter into this conversation. And, and we know from John Hattie's research, from Theodore Sizer's research, from a lot of other research in the peer reviewed journals, these conversations don't happen enough, but when they do, they can be life changing. Now we're speaking to the choir, so to speak. So what we want to do is invite other people in, other people who might not actually have this type of a sphere of influence to hear these mm -hmm. conversations. Uh, Dr. Thibodeau and I are going to throw out some ideas in an email for some other conversations uh, about active, uh, active learning compared to traditional learning and showing how if you do a few subtle things, it can make a big difference. So we're going to throw those ideas out. Um, I'm, I want to respect your time. We've got just a couple minutes. Uh, I want to, I want to, show you the bonus real quick and then just wrap up and then you know feed forward a little bit in terms of where we're going and for those folks i apologize you know you've seen my joke and it might not be that well just bear with me just bear with me folks i'm, I'm gonna <laughs> so so the bonus round i'm just gonna share the screen here real quick as we wrap up um I did promise uh, um, this idea that i was going to introduce you to a couple of really important resources that can change your life right some really good stuff yeah yeah it's a thing called google guess what all those resources that that you're seeing in in you know congregated lists are actually were found on somebody found them on google and if that that google thing isn't working well Matt, there's another resource called youtube <laughs> the point is is that it's always been out there the resources are not in shortage 
you know what, we can all find it. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can always find it. Now, here's something else that I want to really stress. I want you to take a look at the most important person in your learner's lives right now. And that's you. Look in the mirror. But when you look in the mirror, your system might treat you like a pawn in terms of the game of chess where you've got one move, right? The system gives you one move. But guess what? If you look in that mirror, you actually can move like the queen does all over the board. So don't let the system limit you. I want to encourage you all to recognize that you can make the difference, right? So um, other questions, and you, we're, we're going to send you a link to all our good stuff here right away. Uh, there's we're on YouTube channels. We've got a new website coming happening. So we, we want to thank everyone for joining us uh, this morning and entering into the conversation. Um, thank you so much. Um, feel free to invite your colleagues in the future. And uh, oh, go ahead, Alyssa. Yeah. Oh, yes. So I popped in a Flipgrid link. Thanks to Mike and Jamie for the suggestion. So test it out. Because I haven't used, I've created a topic thread under the Flipgrid, which is Learning Labs, and I know we're going to have more of these, and so that's the reason I tried, you know, testing this out with the topic. Test it out, see what you think. I put, I put some prompts there, um, but it's really just a 45-second limit to what did you, what's a key takeaway for you, and I'm hoping somebody will get it started so I can see how this works, um, doing it, broadcasting it out to a larger group, and we're going to listen to these, take your feedback, and, and build Learning Labs based on what you share. So pop that in now, and it'll also be in the email that Dr. H sends out at some point today. We do have another one of these tomorrow at 10 a.m., CDT. Feel free to join if you want to listen to it a third time. <laughs> Jamie, that would be you because you'll be there. Um, yes. And then tomorrow I think we'll be featuring Rhoda and Mike. We'll be sharing a few of their stories, so feel free to join us. But that's it. 901 on the hour. We're in detention. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm so proud of all of you. I, I just thank you, thank you, thank you. You're changing the world one learner at a time. I, I just want to thank you all. You're wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.